Here at Post 9 to break down the road ahead, Goldman Sachs Chief U.S. Equity Strategist David Costin. He's got an S&P target of 4,700 next year, David. So it's not, not a ton of upside, but I like how you use Taylor Swift lyrics for all your notes. All you have to do is stay. That's what you do in the market? Well, I think the, it's a good way of thinking about it. The baseline forecast is modest upside because valuations are pretty high. Earnings are going to grow roughly 5%. But there's a tail scenario, which is if rates stay low and rates have dropped really significantly, real 10-year bond yields were 2.5% at the end of October. They're now roughly 2%. It's a very significant decline in a short period of time. Stocks rallied 10% uh, roughly in the last month. And so to the extent that rates continue to fall or stay at the at, at low levels, that could support uh, an S&P 500 level close to 5,000. Unless they're falling because people are worried about recession, though, right? Absolutely. The question is, what's the reason? Are they falling because inflation's coming down or are they falling because the economy is weakening? And right now, we'd put the argument on the table that the inflation has been coming down, will continue to fall, and that was a, that's a positive story about why rates are falling. Uh, and that's, I'd say, largely a topic that's debated among the portfolio managers with whom I uh, interact. 5% earnings growth next year. Do we get revenue growth, though, in an environment where you see inflation continuing to fall? So all that earnings growth is stemming from revenue growth. Most companies will generate revenue growth of around uh, 5% because that's nominal GDP growth. Real GDP growth around 2%. Inflation is coming down, but it'll probably average close to 3% next year. So 2 plus 3 is 5. Most companies will show top-line revenue growth around 5%. And uh, it's not going to be a margin expansion story. So to answer your question, it's really a, uh, a, a sales, sales story, which is pretty, pretty positive, not, a, not, a, not extraordinary, but a modest level of uh, increase in profits. And valuation is a real challenge. And it's a challenge on the upside. If you were to have uh, you know, a story for higher valuation, would really require uh, bond yields to fall. And uh, they're already at a pretty low level. And our assumption is that real 10-year bond yields will be closer to 2 and a quarter percent at the end of next year, a little bit higher than we are now. Uh, and that supports our 4,700 targets, so a baseline forecast. As I said, there's a scenario where you could have the uh, market rise even more, uh, closer to 5,000 if you had rates uh, you know, continue to fall. Uh, you recently published your hedge fund trend monitor and mutual fundamentals report. You talked to, uh, you know, the five trillion of hedge fund and mutual fund, well, the hedge funds and mutual fund right. managers who represent roughly five trillion. What did you find? Well, it was a couple things that were uh, interesting. One is the whole debate takes place around the big seven stocks, and the uh, hedge funds have tended to be overweight, these uh, magnificent seven, as the sobriquet has uh, come to call them. Uh, so that's sort of one big uh, uh, observation. The second is a huge continued concentration that the top ten positions comprise roughly 70 percent of the long positions of the typical hedge fund, uh, and that's persistent across uh, all, all the funds. So that's been rising, David, over time, and that's uh, another area that does create some risk in terms of performance that this, these, these uh, stocks, major stocks, continue to be the, the leading uh, yeah. the holders. On the other hand, uh, mutual funds tend to be underweight <coughs> these positions, and that's led to a uh, notable underperformance relative to their benchmarks, core managers, Growth managers, only about 20 percent, 25 percent of them are actually beating the benchmark, and that's largely been an issue uh, around the positioning around these, these yeah, that's, stocks. Yeah, that, that is not pretty uh, when you have only 31 percent of large mutual funds uh, kind of meeting their, their benchmarks. Um, what about this market dynamic that we talk about so often? We mentioned even today things have turned and we focus on the Magnificent right. Seven. You know, so, do you expect it to continue, and how are investors supposed to adjust so here's what we did that was original in our research, in, our, in, my, in my opinion, is rather than think about the valuation for the index overall, we focused on fair value for the equal weighted index. What is the typical stock? Is the, how should the typical stock be valued? That's part of part one. And the, well, the index trades are 18 to 19 times in an aggregate context, obviously skewed by some of the biggest stocks. The median stock or the typical stock equal weighted is around 14, 15 times. That is in line, David, with the average for the last 30 years. So the typical stock is sort of averagely valued over, over the last uh, several decades. That's sort of part one. And the second part is, well, what kind of premium should the aggregate index trade relative to the equal weighted index? That's an important dynamic as well. So the average stock, typical stock, is trading fair value. And right now, the Aggregate index is around a 27% premium. Put that arithmetic again, 14 times, roughly 18 times, that's a 27% premium. And that's also fair value in the context of the risk metrics that we look at. And so the message we have is the typical stock is fairly valued. 
and the larger stocks are around uh, the premium that they ought to be trading. And those are looking at risks, uh, metrics around risk premium on right. interest rates, but inflation, et cetera.